You know, God is so good to us in so many different ways. This has been an interesting week for us here, and God has just uh, always shows himself strong. I, I don't have time to go into all the details, but, you know, I love that little, that little song as a child. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Amen? So that, I, that's more true to me every day of my life. And uh, so, uh, praise God. We're thrilled that you could be here today. Um, today, we are going to get right into the teeth of uh, Exodus chapter 2. And so, uh, it's going to be a great time. I went over to Egypt this last week, looked around the Nile River, and found the original uh, <laughs> basket that um, uh, Moses used <laughs> And for a gift of $9.99, I'll send to you absolutely free. You can put your bills in here, they'll be paid, and all that. Oh, no, it's crazy. No, uh, Mrs. Asbury, I told her months ago, I said, I, I'm going to be doing this. Uh, and she makes, uh, she teaches, actually, uh, basket weaving, et cetera. I said, I need something that looks like what Moses. I don't need something pretty or nice with a handle. I don't need any of that, but something. So she made this out, and it's fairly original. And I'll we'll be using this all the way through that series. So today we're looking at the little ark that sank Pharaoh's army. Amen. Now we won't get to Pharaoh's army today, but we are going to get to this. So uh, just want to let you know uh, what that's all about. You know, we could use this for an offering plate too. <laughs> I tell you what, <laughs> that, that, you could very, really put a lot of offering in that. So, uh, but uh, praise the Lord. Well, God bless you. Let's have a moment of prayer. Father, thank you so much for these sweet folks. Thank you that every day with you is sweeter than the day before. Thank you for how you have ministered through this church this week, through teaching and doing funerals and doing other situations, counseling. Father, thank you how you use the members to go out and touch other people's lives and how we've been in uh, three or four nursing homes preaching the gospel this week. Lord, thank you for these dear folks. Thank you, Father, that they want to serve. They want to serve you. We've come here today to give you praise for everything. Thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Dan. Good morning to all my friends and family out there. I was just talking to the youth in the other room over Krispy Kreme donuts and chocolate milk. <laughs> that we're not here in church for ourselves. We're here for each other to serve the family of God. So right now, let's do something crazy. Let's get back up out of our seats. Let's reach over the aisle, shake someone's hand, give them a hug, tell them you're glad they're here. Let's take a moment and welcome one another, all right? Just a couple of announcements. Keep hugging and kissing and shaking hands. Maybe just the hugging and shaking hands. Whoop, whoop. A um, couple of announcements. Really exciting times in case anyone was not aware. We have started our home Bible study ministry. Now, you know, my wife and I do it uh, every Sunday night in our living room. We have people over. We have burritos, tacos, ping pong, movies. If the youth show up, we have games outside with balls involved. There's a cross net game, volleyball game going on. But it's always a lot of fun. And you know what it's about? It's about the Word of God. Amen. It's also about the invitation, though. It's about our witness being not just something we stick people with, but an invitation to come into our lives. So we open up our house, we have them come eat food, and we give them the word, and we make a friend for life. More than, more than most of the time, make a friend for life. So pray for Miss Laverne and Miss Sandy, because they started one in Miss Sandy's living room two weeks ago. Tonight they're meeting again for the second time. So be in prayer for them, because they're having people come to their house, come to Miss Sandy's house, that may not go to church at all and live in their area. They got a couple of new couples that they just kind of met and have been showing up, and it's just been powerful. So pray for Sandy and Laverne on that. Miss Laverne is the teacher, and she is anointed to do so. When she teaches, it's powerful, okay? So be in prayer for that. We also have our ladies' lunch this week, Tuesday, October 3rd. Is it already October? Oh, man. Already? We just got here. Tuesday, October 3rd, we have our ladies' lunch at the Inspirations Tea Room. Um, let, Je let Miss Jeannie know if you will be attending so she can get the proper amount of seating arrangements, okay? 
We, of course, have our uh, men's breakfast this Saturday, October 5th at 8 a.m. Please do come, men. It's powerful. It's always a good time. We pray together. We get fed, and we get fed, okay? We get some yummy bacon and eggs, and we also get the Word of God, and it just lifts us up. It's so good. Uh, we have our annual um, Awana Fall Festival this year on October 30th. We will be having an outdoor Awana Fall Festival. If you'd like to help, please see Miss Chelsea or Mr. Nathan Schwann. And also, you can begin bringing individually wrapped candy on Sundays to the church. We do take donations for the candy, okay? So please, if you can, grab an extra bag over there at Walmart or Crest, throw it in your cart, and just bring it to the church, lay it down on the table. We'll pick it up. Believe me, we will. And we'll be very grateful for that as well. Um, and then something new, something new happening soon. Uh, my wife and I are going to start a Friday night movie night, just trying to attract new people, okay? We are going to try to do it out back on a projector with a screen, which we already own. Uh, this week, this Friday night, we're going to be watching the movie Woodlawn, okay? You ever heard of Woodlawn, anyone? It's a powerful movie. Uh, there was this young man that my dad was real close with a few years ago, Chinese young man. Didn't speak really that good English, you know? Didn't have any idea what the cross was when we first met him, because in China, that's not something they just teach everybody. But when he got to Mississippi, he met Phil and Marty. Um, we, we loved on this guy. For two years, we loved on this guy. His name's Roger. And then one day, he runs onto the college campus where Phil was walking through. And he goes, Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil, I finally understand. He said, I got saved last night in my dorm room watching Woodlawn. The movie Woodlawn, just the Holy Spirit unlocked it. And he just gave up his heart right there. We baptized him that Sunday. It was powerful. So this movie is extra special to me, per personally. Please come Friday night, 6.30. We're going to have popcorn. We're going to have a little bit of candy. We're going to have a godly movie. Bring people. That's the idea. Bring your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends. And be in prayer about that, okay? Even if you can't make it. All right, I think I may have missed one or two things. No, I think that's about it. Uh, Wednesday night, let's come come get fed, okay? We have dinner from 5.15 to 6.15. We have adult Bible study at 6.30. We have youth. We have Awanas. It's always just plenty for everyone, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And Brother Dan will be preaching from the book of Daniel, okay, of course. Chapter 12, that's right. Thank you, sir. Ta chapter 12. The Awana children are going to be enjoying Silly String Wednesday, which is my favorite day of the week. All right. Uh, at this time, uh, if, the, if the deacons would go ahead and prepare, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to bring the offering plates up, and we're going to have an offering. Um, give as God has blessed you, okay? And if you do have a need, please feel free to take from the plate if needed. And if you feel weird about that, you can come see Brother Dan, me, or one of our deacons after the service. If there's a need, we can help you meet as well. All right, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all of these things. Everything each one of us has in our hands, you gave it to us. Father, as a, as a steward, to make use of it, our time, our breath, the, the money that we, we do have, Lord God, our, any possession, it's from you, but it's for you. Lord, move in our hearts today as we decide to give, to give to you as you've blessed us. Thank you for what you're doing. Use these tithes and offerings to forward your kingdom. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning.
that first song we sung, uh, I know that one from years ago. So uh, praise the Lord. Well, if you'll take your notes, please. We'll, we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Exodus. We had a great study through the book of Genesis. I so enjoyed uh, preaching that for you and, and studying that. But I tell you what, I, I'm just... I, I should start paying you. I mean, you don't need to pay me anything because <laughs> I, I, I'm having so much fun studying the book of Exodus. I can't sleep at night. I have to backslide to go to sleep. It's, uh, it's just terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, it's, it's a, what a great book there. And um, I'm taking a little course. Uh, I'm just auditing it, not... Uh, for any credit whatsoever on Egyptianology, and I've been at it now for almost a month, and um, it's very interesting. It's helping me see from a backside forward, uh, and help, helping me uh, apply the Word of God to these verses that I've not been able to do before. So I think this is very helpful. This morning, we uh, look, now next week we're going to be looking at Exodus 3, just in case I don't get to tell you that at the end. That's what I, my goal is. It's about the burning bush. Oh my goodness, folks, please don't, don't miss next week. Invite someone to come with you, especially, especially some Christian whose fire has gone out. I'm going to bring a message. I think I'm going to entitle it, Any Old Bush Will Do. Any old bush will do, as long as you've got the God, uh, the fire of God in it. Doesn't matter. The bush is irrelevant. It's the fire that wouldn't go out. It wasn't the bush that was a bush. If you set it on fire, it just burns itself up and it's gone. But we're talking here about uh, next week, this power of the Holy Spirit and how he can work in and through our lives. Today, we look at God's little ark that sank Pharaoh's army. So, um, you know, what legacy will you leave when you pass into eternity? I mean, think about that for a moment. When you leave this world, I did two funerals this week, and so uh, one down in Wewoka, and we went to Ada, and then another one uh, in Stroud, America. <laughs> uh, uh, I haven't been in, actually in the city of Stroud since I was 16 years old. It was the last place that I ever played baseball in my life. Uh, and, uh, of course, I didn't know how to get there because I just, we just drove a bus and we were all cutting up on the way over from Jones. And, um, and so we, we get out and we play that game. I didn't know it was going to be my last game because it was at the end of the spring. And um, I uh, went to Falls Creek and the Holy Spirit of God said, I, I, you can, you know, put down all this sports stuff. And I'm going to call you to the ministry, and that's what I started doing. But yes, when I, when I was there on Friday, Brother Rob's mother, we buried her there, and just about a mile outside of uh, Stroud or so. So I'm driving back, and I happened to go by the school, and one of the men there told me, he said, uh, there is, that's where the ball field is, and I looked back there, and sure enough, it looked familiar. So I pulled off the road, drove over there, and got out of the car and the gate was open and I'm, you know, it's Friday afternoon or Friday sometime. It's hot, you know, but I, I walk out there on that pitcher's mound and I stand there and I remember I was, I was 55 years ago standing there throwing the, trying to throw those guys out. I, if I remember right, and I'm not trying to brag, but I think we did win that if I, if my memory, <laughs> uh, but it was, it would be the, that was the last game of the season. And then I would never do that again. And it was my intention to be the next Don Drysdale. That was my, uh, I thought, oh, yeah, uh, there's no question. I'm, uh, I was a right-hander, so, you know, he was. My favorite pitcher is Sandy Koufax, but he's left hand, so I could, couldn't actually do that. But, but needless to say, I bowed my head there, and I didn't feel like I needed, I needed to do more, so I knelt down right there on the, on the rubber uh, that the pitcher pushes off on. I just knelt there, 
And I say, God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for 60. I mean, uh, and here I'm back here 55 years later, same spot. And then the Spirit of God began to speak to my heart. Tears were running down my face. You know, there's no crying in baseball, folks, you know. So uh, I, it, I, it might have been just sweat because it was hot. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm out there, yes, and the Lord just impressed my heart said, you know, you pitch for me every week. When you walk up there to that pulpit, that's your pitcher's mound. And he said, you are to throw the ball that I give you. And I'm the one that calls what you're going to throw. <laughs> so, and, uh, but, um, and boy, it was just a little revival there at the Stroud baseball field for Dan Maxwell uh, Friday. And uh, it just kind of got me. I, let me get away from that. Good night. I don't know. It's still reminiscing, you know, but... Uh, but hallelujah, it's amazing how God can do things in your life. But what legacy will you leave when you pass eternity? I wrote this yesterday thinking about it. How will your faith influence those who come after you? As we consider the life of Moses this morning from his birth to his banishment, we're going to look 80 years, we witness the provincial I mean, the providential hand of Almighty God and the impact that these parents, Amram and Jochebed, had in bringing a wholehearted faith to him. You know, you may be, <laughs> this may be the most important message of your life that you will ever hear because it's, God wants to use you just like he used Moses. Amen. We're the same thing. I'm going to read the whole text to you. I think that's the best way to do an introduction is read the text and give you some um, neat story or something. So here we go. Verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi. Now, please note the tribe of Levi. You remember who Levi is, third son of Abraham. Went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So they're both Levi's, Amram, Jochebed. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a beautiful child. Now remember who's writing this, Moses. So hey, I was a pretty good looking guy. <laughs> so, no, no, the Holy Spirit's telling him to do that. So she hid him for three months. But when she no longer hid him, she could, she could, could hide him. She took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch. I'm going to really emphasize that in a moment. And put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister Miriam stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. I mean, right on time, boom. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children, because they were killing all the babies, you remember? And so now, at three months, um, uh, Jochebed and Amram choose to place this child in, a, in, in God's providential hands. Verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. <laughs> That's pretty, this is a smart little girl. The, then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, uh, Take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, because I drew him out of the water. That's what the name Moses means in Hebrew. Verse 11, Now it came to pass in those days 
when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at the burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way, and he looked that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? And then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Okay, they know now. So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water. And they filled the trough to water with their father's flock. Then the shepherds came. Now these are probably Amalekites because they are very evil and they lived in that part of the land. And um, then the, the Amalekites, these shepherds came and drove them away, drove away uh, these girls' uh, sheep of their father. And Moses stood up and he helped them. I mean, he fought them off. And then he watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel, that's Jethro's actual name. The word Jethro is actually a title of being priest of Midian. And so uh, Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? He said, how did you get done with all the sheep and you're back home so soon? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us to water the flock. So he said to his seven daughters, he's got seven unmarried daughters, where is he? This is Midian out here in nowhere. You guys, you got a good-looking, strong, brave Egyptian. Go get him. Are you nuts? Go get him. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm just adding to that, okay? So, but, but why is it that you have left the man? That's, I kind of read that in there. Do you see? Call him that he may eat bread. Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Sipporah his daughter to Moses. And she bore him a son and called him Gershom and said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. That's what Gershom means. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out. Please circle that. They cried out. Didn't say they cried out to God, but they're crying. They cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Father, once more, I ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to preach your word today, to bring glory to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let me just give you some introduction here. Um, Israelites are now slaves. They've been slaves for at least 200 years. They've been there for over 400 years, about 430 years to be exact. Um, you know, uh, you know, then, of course, uh, Joseph dies, and then another uh, uh, Pharaoh came about who knew not Joseph. We looked at that last week and made them into slaves. Um, so the policy is to, um, uh, they, they became so many of them there in Goshen. Remember, there were 70, and with uh, Joseph's uh, family, there were 75 of them altogether. So that's turned into about two and a half million people now. They went down there as a family. 400 years later, it's about two and a half million. And the Pharaoh is afraid that if someone comes to try to overtake them, that the uh, children of Israel will join them, uh, and, and really, you know, they, they couldn't fight them off, you know, with them. So they, he said, all right, every male child shall die. Yeah, every time a male child is born, uh, you shall put them in the Nile, 
and they worshiped the Nile. They thought it was a god. Onesis was his name, and they worshiped that. So throw them in there. They'll either drown or the crocodiles will eat them, and so, and that's what they did. They told that to the midwives. However, when Moses was born, they didn't do that. They hid him for three months, and after three months could no longer hide him. So we see that they are in slavery here. They're oppressed. Um, uh, do we have that film? Uh, the, the, put it up here, that little slide. I don't know. I don't have my, uh, didn't put my, uh, I taught Sunday school this morning, so I, I forgot to put my um, pointer, my laser pointer there. Uh, I'm talking about the, um, uh, the Egyptians. Can we put that there? That's okay. That's all right. I don't have time to wait. So, oh, there we go. There we go. Good. Can you see the? the this is from an obelisk uh, there in, uh, I believe this is in Thames, but uh, you can see how these are. They're on their knees, and they are uh, bondage by their neck. Uh, these are slaves there. So. And uh, that was very common for the Hebrews to be treated that way. So I just kind of wanted to make that point to you that that's who they, that's who they are there. God predicted the pros, you know, prosperity, of slavery, and exodus of the Israelites. We saw that in Genesis 15. When we were going through Genesis, the Bible says there, verse 13, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. That would be Egypt. And serve them, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, he told them the time. And also the nation whom they serve, I'm going to judge them ultimately. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, hundreds of years before, um, uh, you know, uh, it's been about, about oh, not quite 200 years since uh, Abraham when Joseph is born. So now we see, he says, this is going to happen. And of course, that's what, exactly what happened with Joseph and that I like Deacon Stephen. Remember, he was stoned to death, first martyr that we see. We, he, he defended himself to the Sanhedrin people simply by giving the testimony of Moses. And we find that in Acts chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. Let me read it to you. But here is Stephen about to be stoned, but he's, he's giving praise to God. He says, but God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring uh, them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And so we see it in, with Abraham. We see it with Deacon Stephen at his uh, point of being stoned to death. We see all these things taking place here. God has already foretold it. And then he uh, re repeats it again through Stephen here um, in God's word. The, the, in Exodus chapter 2 covers 80 years, eight zero years of Moses' life. Now, he's going to live to 120. He does it in 40s. <laughs> so he took him 40 years from the time of being in the basket to being um, until he is ready to leave. He, has, he kills the Egyptian and leaves. He's 40 years in the desert and 40 years uh, taking, lapping the desert with these folks to get them into the promised land. So the, he's 120 years old and God's got him in, um, in training. And so we see that there. Um, and so... Uh, let me just share with you there that it starts, uh, 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 there are, I put it all in P's so that you can remember. The first 40 years was pampering. You know, he's, he's there in the palace. I mean, now they go get his mother. I mean, isn't that great? I always love that. When I dedicate babies, I always quote that verse of that princess because I think that's a beautiful, God was speaking through her to every parent. And when I dedicate your baby and, you're, and we're standing right here in front of you and you're, you have a new child we're going to dedicate to the Lord, I, I always say, take this child and raise it for me. And when the day is done, I will pay you wages. If you'll raise your child for God, God will pay you wages when the, when the work's done. Amen. So that's the, that's the promise of 
that we see. So she says, hey, uh, can I go, you know, this little sister, Miriam. Now he's got, Miriam is uh, his oldest sister, and then there's Aaron, who's three years older. So they, so Miriam is following the, the little basket. It's, you know, they take the basket, and they put him in there, and it's floating down. I mean, this is a, think about this, folks, putting your baby in a Nile River, not knowing what, which way that current's going to take it, not knowing if a crocodile is going to come up and make quick work of it. You don't know any of this, but she trusted God. Amen. She knows that at, when he's three months old, he is crying, and they've got spies everywhere looking for these children, so they couldn't keep him hid any longer. So they made that decision. And then Miriam goes and gets her mom, and now she's, the mother's being paid to uh, take care of, the, uh, uh, of her own son. And you see, they didn't just, uh, like mothers do today, you know, it didn't take long to wean a child. Back then it took three years. Three years was a very common thing to wean a child because they didn't have, you know, all the things that we have to do. And so for those three years, what do you think Jochebed's doing? She's teaching that little baby. She's teaching that little boy. She's putting some things inside his heart when he's age 40. He does, he's never forgotten them. Now, so we, we see that there. So he was pampered in the... Now, also, she gives him over, ladies, to a, a, an idolater, someone who worships idols. To, uh, to the Egyptians, to, to be her son. In order to save him, she does that, to say, God, I trust you. Amen? Amen? And God had that all worked out. I tell you what, it's amazing how God works. And so um, uh, that's exactly what, what took place. So, but he was pampered for the first 40 years. Then the next 40 years, um, he is being prepared and so he kills an Egyptian. He, his mother puts in him that he was a Hebrew. He sees the, uh, an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. He goes over and slays the Egyptian. He looks this way, the Bible says, and he looks that way. Didn't see anyone. Obviously, somebody was watching because somebody found him out. But he kills the Egyptian. Now, keep in mind, he is a powerful man. This man is going to be probably what I've read and studied is that he, to Moses was the uh, most likely Pharaoh at that time, and he had no children, and Moses was going to be the next Pharaoh. They had sent him to the Temple of the Sun. That's the Harvard of that day and time. He, had, he was a great general. He had overtaken the Ethiopians and, and captured them, I mean, Moses did. He, he's well known in Egyptian history as a very great uh, military leader, intelligent, uh, smart, but now he identifies with the Hebrews because that's who he is. He's a Levite even, and he kills the Egyptian, but he looked that way, and he looked that way, and he thought, I'll just go ahead and take this guy out. And so I don't know if he used karate. I don't know what they did back then. Maybe they did the Egyptian thing. I have no idea. But, but some way, they took him out. And he buries him in the sand. And he's found out. So now Pharaoh says, you know, if you kill an Egyptian, you die. That's their basic rule. You kill them. It doesn't matter who you are. You're dead. So uh, even though he would, didn't want to kill him, but he... He's going to make him flee, so he flees. He, and there he goes to uh, uh, Midian. Now, do we have a, a, the map of Midian? I'm sorry I didn't bring my laser pointer to you. If we've got that map of the Sinai Peninsula, I'd like to put that up there so that they can see where that is because uh, yeah, I'd like for them to catch that. So... Um, um, I like what D.L. Moody, while they're getting that ready for you, said, D.L. Moody said, and I quote, Moses spent 40 years in the king's palace thinking that he was somebody. Then he lived 40 years in the wilderness finding out that God, uh, without God, he was a nobody. Finally, he spent 40 years discovering how nobody with God can be a somebody. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, amen. And so, um, uh, uh, 
God sent Moses to the greatest seminary in the world. I believe the greatest seminary in the world is the Desert Theological Seminary. And God is the instructor. Amen. For 40 years, he's out there learning. God is teaching him. And he received the very great degree of the BSD degree. The BSD, yes, the BSD degree. Backside of the desert degree. He got it. Oh, guess what? He's not the only one that got that. Um, The Apostle Paul got one of those too. After he got saved on the road to Damascus, God sent him to the Arabian Desert. That's on the other side of Midian. And he was there for three years, and the Lord put him on the backside, and he got his BSD. Oh, by the way, David got a BSD too. Uh, He was all around the Judean Desert, and God, for many years, being chased by Saul, and God taught him the backside of the desert. That's usually the best seminary in the world is when God puts you behind and teaches you like that. Hallelujah. And so notice um, I've already given you some gene- uh, genealogy of Moses. You know, there are Levi's. His, that's the third son of uh, Abraham. Excuse me, I said Abraham. Jacob, excuse me. His third son of Jacob was Levi. And that's where the priestly tribe came from. Now, the, now Le- Levi has three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merah. Now, Kohath is the uh, that's middle son. You need to remember him because he has four sons: Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uzel. Now, you're going to get a test on this uh, next week, so please remember all those and spell them correctly if you could, please. And <laughs> so, but but Amram and Jochebed, that's where Amram comes from. Amen. These are the parents of Moses. These, uh, praise God, and we, we're going to see them in Exodus 6.20. He's going to tell you about his parents, and etc. but that's down the line. Just thought I'd let you know that right now. So Amram, the word Amram means exalted people. Ja- Jacobad or Jacobad means Yahweh gives weight. Now, when you see that word weight, that means the same word in the Ten Commandments, Honor thy father and thy mother. That means give weight to your uh, mother and father. Now, no mother wants more weight, I don't think. But it's the, when it means weight, it means honor. It means, and so, um, so it means, that's, that was her name. Yahweh gives honor. And so he certainly honored Jochebed, and he honored Amram. And we see the, these parents that had faith to trust God with this little child. And now we see him as a baby. He's a beautiful child. Verse 2, that Hebrew word tov, T-O-V. I take you to Israel. One of the first things we are going to teach you when we get there is how to say good morning. And it's broka tov. And that means good morning or morning beautiful. Broka tov, all right? And so... um, uh, Matzah tov, you know, people call it tov today. That's anglicized, but tov is the correct way. Good, you know, he's a good-looking kid, all right? Um, And so uh, uh, that's what tov means, beautiful. Every parent thinks their child is a beautiful child, amen? Uh, The Apocrypha tells us that, and, and we don't, that's not, a biblical source, but it's an outside biblical source, so, said that Moses was so good looking, people would stop and stare at him. So, I mean, he did look sort of like, maybe Charlton Heston looked like Moses, I don't know. But his parents may, may have seen he was a special destiny. He's got something that God, the Spirit of God rested on him. And so he's one of the most remarkable, obviously one of the most remarkable men of all history. Now, there's a guy named Michael Shapiro, a Jewish scholar, and he has written a book of the top 100 Jewish, most influential Jewish people in history. And number one on the list is Moses, and then Jesus, and then number three, Albert Einstein. Um, 
And then number six, he has Apostle Paul. Number seven, Karl Marx. <laughs> I don't think I'd put that in there. But I do think he does get one. Number 98 is Sandy Koufax. Amen. Left-hand pitcher. Amen. And so, uh, but, um, uh, but they put Moses at the front. But then, of course, being a Jewish guy, I could understand why they did that. But still, uh, I would not do that. Hebrews 11.23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a tov, a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. His parents feared the God of heaven more than the king on the earth. Do you fear the God of heaven more than anything? Hey, folks, I'm for voting. I'm for being a good American and to pray about your vote because it's not your vote, it's the Lord's vote. Amen. And so all of us should vote if you are capable of voting. But here's the thing my hope is not in the White House or the out house or any house. My hope is in heaven. Amen. So I'm trying to tell you, yes, vote. I'm telling you, be an American, stand up, especially against all this weirdo stuff we're seeing today. But uh, remember uh, what happened with Moses. I mean, look who was in charge then. And God, God had a way of taking that out. In fact, he kind of get, gets me. Moses kills one Egyptian, puts him in the sand. And I kind of think that God tells him at the end, there, there in the desert, he said, you know, okay, you killed your one Egyptian. Let me show you how to take care of Egyptians. I'm going to wash them out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to see that a little bit later there, okay? <laughs> and uh, whenever, if you find that uh, Sinai Peninsula deal, I'd like to put that up there if we could, please, because i like for them to see where Midian is. Midian, is, today they tell you that Mount Sinai is in Egypt. That's insane. It's not there. That Marco Polo in the 12th century said, that's Mount Sinai. How did he know? He's just walking around. Uh, that's, that's Mount Sinai. It, it doesn't know. Midian has always been in Midian. Have you? It's amazing. There, there we have it. There. Now, you see the Sinai Peninsula in the center here? Right up here is Goshen. Okay, that's Egypt. So Moses is going to, when he gets, he kills the Egyptian, he leaves there, comes down here uh, through the Sinai Peninsula, and you see this little leg of the Red Sea? Go about halfway, and that's where he probably went around and went into the land of Midian. About where that elm is, where it says Midian, that's about where Mount Sinai is. If you go right straight to that little uh, uh, finger right there, that's where Moses crossed. That's where they have found 422 Egyptian chariots there, 30, uh, uh, right there. And I, I plan to look at those one day if I can, uh, at least a, f a few of them. I, my cardiologist won't let me dive down there, so I'm just going to... Uh, he said, you know, if you want a free dive, you can go down and, well, until you kill yourself. I said, okay, great. So, um, uh, but, um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, try to do that next time. But that's, that's Midian. Do you see it? I want to make sure you see, see where Arabia is. Midian has always been in Midian. Mount Sinai has always been in Midian. Amen? That's what the Bible says. So don't, don't buy any of this godly goop. That's ridiculous. And so... Uh, <clears throat> now, the mother, in verse 3, says she t no longer could hide him. She made an ark uh, bulrush basket and put asphalt and pitch up on it. Now, I don't have any asphalt or pitch here, and that word pitch is the same word we see with Noah's ark. In fact, the word ark is the same, teve. Teve means a box, and that's what the ark really is. It's just a floating box. Uh, made out of wood, obviously, and they pitched it without and within. Same way with this little ark. How many people were in the ark? When you say eight, you would be wrong. There were eight in Noah's ark, and there's one here, so that makes nine. Amen? And so, um, but you, they, that word for covered or pitch is the Hebrew word kapar. I think I put it in your notes. Hopefully I did. Kapar. Kapar means to cover. 
73% of the time when you see the Hebrew word kapar in the Old Testament, it means atonement. Atonement. What is the atonement? Whether it is Noah's ark or this little ark, it, the atonement was, it, it waterproofed this. And it did it with Noah's ark too. It holds back the wrath of God. That's what happened with Kapar. 73% of the time, that's how it's translated, atonement of God. Holding back the atonement. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. God's wrath can't come to Dan Maxwell, then I richly deserve it, but you know why? Because I'm covered by Kapar. Atonement, amen? So this was the atonement. How safe was Moses? He was as safe as God, amen? Because the atonement was inside and out, amen? How safe was Noah? He might have fallen down in the ark, but he didn't fall out of it, amen? Hallelujah. And he said, you really believe in that ark thing? Oh, yeah, just go up. there. They found it in Kentucky, remember? So uh, just go up there and look at it. (laughs) <laughs> but no, absolutely, I believe. I believe what the Bible says. The, these Dr. Drybuckets and Dr. Fluffyheads that want to deny the Bible, I don't have time for that. I, it, why, why do that? And uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. So the, uh, here comes, there's, a, there's cries that reveal a great set of lungs. <laughs> Exodus 4, 10. Uh, Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He wasn't slow on that day because the princess comes down, and remember, they worshiped the Nile. That was the god Onassis. And she walked in, and when they would go in to give, uh, they would bathe there as a sacrifice, you know, just uh, as to give homage to Onassis, that god. And when they walked into that river, they would say, I have uh, hurt no man, and I have not kept uh, the, uh, my uh, breast milk from sucklings. That was uh, two, I think there's four or five things they would say. I can't remember them all. But, though, but she might have been saying that. And her maids find this, and they opened it up. I think an angel came down and pinched his little rear. And I don't know if that's true, but he started crying right on cue. And it stole her heart. Amen. Boom. She heard that cry. The Bible says, and God heard the cry of the Hebrews. Hey, wait a second. Moses heard the cry of a Hebrew at 40 years old. He's over there. Here's an Egyptian. He goes over and kills the Egyptian. You know, later on, you're going to find out where God is in, in, in uh, Mount Erech. Uh, Mount, you know, uh, that's, that's Noah. I'm getting that mixed up now. Up in Mount Sinai. And, and God says, I'm going to kill these people because they're uh, doing the golden calf thing. I, I, and, and Moses pleads with God, no, no, no. He intercedes. And he said, well, then I'm not going to go with them. I'll just send an angel. He said, no, 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 no. If you don't go, I'm not going either. God was, that was a test. But God heard Moses cry. You know what? It hit me this week. I didn't read this in any book or anything, but God got a man who could hear the cry of others. He got a man who would plead for their soul. He said, kill me, take my soul, but save these Hebrews. He heard the cry of that Hebrew being killed by being beaten by that Egyptian. Moses had a heart like God's. If you want to know why God used Moses, he had a heart like, oh, he wasn't perfect. No, he he had a temper. 
You know, he's, he didn't have to kill that Egyptian. He could have just, you know, whooped him, and that would have been that. But, uh, but no, he kills him. And he comes down out of the mountain, and he's got two tablets that God just wrote, the Ten Commandments, and he's like the first doctor there ever was. Take two tablets and call me in the morning. Uh, that was all. Now God's going to make him write them. Sounds just like my teachers would do with me if I was to throw a little temper tantrum like that. And then later on, he's going to strike a rock rather than speak to a rock. Yeah, he's got some issues. But he hears the cry of the hurting. Do you hear the cry of little babies that would like to be born but are aborted? Do you hear the cry of mothers that have gone through the tragedy of having an abortion? If you are like that here today, my heart's out to you, ladies. I'm not trying to point a finger at you. I'm trying to encourage you to let you know God hears your cry. God's taking care of that child. You'll see that child again. Hallelujah. My point is this, if God is looking for people who hear cries, and my friends here at Chisholm Creek Baptist Church, we must be people who hear the cry of people and take them the good news of Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the atonement. Only the atonement can hold back the wrath of a living God. Amen. That's the bulrush basket that God has given us through his own son's shed blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. Amen. I almost get excited when I think of that. <laughs> I have to keep it under control because I want to go on a holy run. But <laughs> at 71, I don't run too fast anymore. But, but let me move on. But I want you to see that. Oh, I, I got to move on because my time is going to run past me here. But, but uh, <clears throat> so we, we see that. Uh, uh, this is a very religious society, Egypt is, but they are a polytheistic society, many gods. Ra is the sun god. Heka is the frog god. Oasis, the Nile god. I'm going to give you all 10 of their major gods, and God and these gods are going to have a, a, a contest later on. And you can guess who's going to win that contest, but it helped the Jews and the world and everyone to see, there, thou shalt have no other God before me. That was the first commandment. And my dear friend, if you don't get that commandment down, Forget reading the others. They're not going to help you. You shall have no other God before you but the true and living God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, it's like, I think I could... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I mean, sometimes I wonder, it's harder to get a, an amen than a $100 bill. I mean, it's amazing. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, Amen. Hallelujah, God and only God. And so we see that. And uh, oh, what a beautiful picture. And I just don't have time to go through all this, but the prince of Egypt, we see him there and all that's like there and what's going on. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to do what? To suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 11, 24 and 25. Moses, you know, he, after murdering that Egyptian, he, you see, he looked this way. He looked that way. He forgot to look this way. When you think nobody is watching, look up. We run our lives horizontally, but we should keep our attention vertically, that God sees it and knows it. And so he, hid, he tries to cover it up, but he can't cover it up. And uh, he was impetuous, and, and he, when he was found out, he goes off. 
All the worldly training Moses received in Egypt was not enough for the spiritual task of shepherding God's people. God's going to have to put him in the backside of the desert degree program, and there he will prepare him for 40 years. There at Midian, he beats off these uh, shepherds, probably Am uh, Amalekites, and after doing that, he is... Uh, he pumps the water for these seven girls. These are the daughters of uh, Roel or Jethro, whatever you want, whatever you want to use his name. And um, so they get home early, and he says, "Hey," and they tell him, "Oh, how do you get home so early?" So, well, this guy came and he beat off these shepherds, and then he pumped the water for us or draw, drew it from the well, and, and and everything. And he said, "Well, where is he?" He said, "Girls, look." We're in Midian. It's the, the word Midian means place of no pasture. So we, we are here in nowhere land. I've got seven girls, and there's a good-looking Egyptian that just beat up the Amalekites and, and did all this for you. Get, girls, are you nuts? Go get him and get him in here So because one of you need to marry this guy. You know, now, he didn't go through all that. Okay, I'm just teasing around. But thank God. Uh, Zipporah, the oldest, married, they get married. And, um, and so we thank God for that. But, um, so the, I, w what a wonderful story. And there's so many things here. And, uh, you know, just look how God organized all this, how God coordinated it, put it all together, the timing. It's unbelievable. It reminds me of this elderly lady. She was up in years, and she just loved the Lord with her whole heart. And she was always praising the Lord, and hallelujah, and carrying on. And her next door, she lived in a duplex, and the guy next door was an out-and-out -out atheist. And he hated this old woman. He just couldn't stand her, because she was always praising God. And he heard her praying out loud one night. She had run out of groceries. And he had an idea. He said, you know, I'll fix her. So he goes down to the grocery store and buys a ton. I mean, a pile of groceries for her. Puts it on her doorstep. She opens the door, and you can imagine, she just starts thanking the Lord. She starts praising the Lord and thanking the Lord. And this atheist jumps out. He said, you old woman. He said, you're crazy. He said, no, that God didn't do that. I did that. And when she hears that, she starts really rolling. Oh, praise God, hallelujah. She goes up and down the driveway. She can't take it in. Oh, she's just hopping up and down, hallelujah. He said, didn't you hear what I said? She said, yes, I did. He said, you know, I knew God would provide for me, but I didn't know he'd make the devil pay for it. Yes, God will provide for them and I'll, I'm going to take care of Moses, and I'm going to pay Jochebed wages for taking care of her own son. <laughs> I mean, isn't it amazing how God works? Only God could do that. Praise the Lord. What a God we have. He was God prepared and God chosen, and he delivered the people from the Egyptian bondage ultimately. Rejected by Israel at his first coming. Remember, he came back at 40. He was ready to lead them out. I mean, he, but he was rejected. They turned away. They would not follow a murderer. So where does he turn to? The Jews won't follow him, so he turns to the Gentiles. Hmm, that's really what, that's who he married. He married a Gentile bride. Zipporah, she was loosely affiliated with uh, them, but very loosely, uh, really uh, um, seen as a Gentile, Zipporah. Later, it appears to, he goes back a second time, and at the second coming, he frees the children of Israel. Do you see an analogy in there? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Stephen makes a parallel between Moses and Jesus in Acts chapter 7. 
The book of Romans sees Jesus as the last Adam. The book of Hebrews sees him as the last Moses. Gershom is born. Gershom means foreigner, uh, banishment. And that's how Moses saw himself when his son was born. But Moses really represented, you know, ultimately he's going to have another boy named Eleazar, and God will use him. God's children cry out, and I'm done. Verse 23, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel groaned. They're crying because of the bondage. They cried out. It doesn't say they cried out to God. They're just crying out. They've been there for 400 years and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning. Thank God we have a God who hears, amen? I can't, I can't say that enough. And God remembered. He remembered. He, of course, he never forgets. But his covenant with Abraham and God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. That's how this closes. They, were, they are helpless. They're crying. Oh, hallelujah. God remembered his covenant. God is a covenant-keeping God. He never forgets. The time comes to deliver the people. And he'll do that. Psalm chapter 90 is written by, guess who? Moses. Let me read you verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wow. There's so much in there, it would take me two weeks to even scratch the surface. He's saying, let God make your choices for you. And let time, don't worry. You're thinking, I'm at a dead-end job doing nothing. No, you're just getting your BSD degree right now. Backside of the desert degree. It's okay. God's preparing you. You remember Jesus' parable of the rich fool in Luke 12? He said, I'll tear down my barns, build bigger barns, and I'll say to my soul, soul, take thy ease, and eat, drink, and be merry. And so, uh, and all of a sudden, God's, the Lord says, you fool, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. And then who's all this stuff is going to? To belong to. In our neighborhood, they, they have neighborhood uh, garage sales. I don't know if they do that where you live, but they do in ours. And of course, that's all demonic. You know, I try to stay with. But Jeannie likes to dabble in that area, so she goes, okay, not very much, but every now and then. We got more junk already. We don't need uh, more, more people's junk. But you know what? You, you gather all kinds of stuff. I want to tell you something. It's just like my mother taught me once when I was playing Monopoly as a little boy. In fact, I was playing it with Carolyn. Uh, Pam's, uh, uh, and, and Judy, I, 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 both of them, I, they taught me how to do numbers, play Monopoly as a little boy. And I would always lose. And so I just kept trying all summer, trying, trying, trying. Finally, one day, I watched my mother and my aunt, or aunts, both of them, I watched what they did. They bought everything. See, I, my parents came out of the Depression, so I saved everything. That's not how you play Monopoly. You buy everything. So I, I, one day, I just started buying everything. And one day, I remember it like yesterday. I won. I won. I methodically and gradually crushed my dear mother and aunt and made them go bankrupt. And, oh, it was wonderful and then my mother taught me a great lesson all right now Danny it all goes back in the box oh no mama I'm leaving this out boardwalk park place all these houses oh yeah uh, no no we gotta leave it out I gotta no it always goes back in the box 
And all that stuff will belong to somebody else the next game. It always goes back in the box. Don't live for this world. It's going to go back in the box. In fact, I can take you to the grave of Buddha. You'll go back in the box. They'll put you in the ground one day. And I can take you to Buddha's tomb. He's still in there. I can take you to Muhammad. He's still in there. I can take you to Jerusalem, as I've done many of you over the years. And when you go there, there's no one in there. Why? Because they came out of the box because of the atonement of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The only way to escape the box is to have an atonement, is to have what happened to my body. Oh, there, there it is. The only way to escape it is to be covered by the blood of Jesus. My friend, you'll go all the way home. What a Savior. Amen. Amen. That's right. Would you bow your head with me, please? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You may not understand everything I preached on, but you say, Pastor Dan, I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. If I died at this very moment, I'm not certain. I had the privilege this week to lead a mortician to Christ. He came running up to me and he said, I have heard thousands of sermons, but I've never heard anything like that. And he said, I just went through a divorce. I'm a Catholic, but I don't know Christ. I put him in the front seat of my car and led him to Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. The blood covering. God heard that man's cry and sent me to Ada to help him. God hears your cry today. That's the kind of God he is. And that's the kind of people we need to be too. People who hear people's cry and share with them the good news of Christ. Would you pray in your heart a prayer of faith just like I prayed with this mortician to say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Come and live in my heart. Forgive me of my sin save my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. We're going to sing one verse. If you really meant that prayer with all your heart, come and let me pray with you, encourage you. You want to come and join the fellowship, make other decisions, you come. We're going to sing one verse when we stand in the moment. You do what God tells you to do. Father, take this message, may it bring glory to you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Brother Travis and I are right here. You come quickly. Step out. Step out and come.